And that's when we get the line, I'm strangely comfortable with it in a terrible Irish accent, which is like famous. Now. It, I, like, I, there was another amazing line in my memory. Like, uh, you guys ruined this for me. Why would you make me watch this again? <laughs> Why did they, they changed it with all the things, had great stuff. Don't worry, I'm sure there was a firefight. It's still going to be great, Heath. We're holding out for that, there was a firefight. That is locked in forever. That will be. It's going to no, be it, wonderful. It's by far we the will worst sing it together in, in harmony. Be, thank you. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, or they'll take another finger. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome Willem back. Willem Dafoe, Noah, to answer your question, <laughs> Willem Dafoe is an amazing actor. Amazing. I, I, you know, honestly, this is, like, if it hadn't been for this movie, I would be like, yes, no brainer, absolutely, you are correct, but I don't, I can't, oh. I'm just, they have the last performance I saw was this one, so. Uh. He never <laughs> stops acting, he acts so hard, he's such an acting actor. You can, you yeah, because you can tell, you can always tell a great actor when you can see them acting every minute they're on the goddamn when screen. You really, yes. When you really feel the acting. Right in your face. Exactly. Yeah. It's like a juggler. You got to make it look hard. My, otherwise, they yeah, won't exactly, clap. Exactly. Exactly. Right. My teeth hurt. He acted a lot. <laughs> Willem Dafoe opens this movie by doing a pitch up for himself. Okay, now this movie's the big trick. So I want everyone to go absolutely <laughs> crazy. <laughs> All right. And of course, that was my bad friend who sits 900 miles to my northeast and has better intrinsic taste in films. Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I go away for one week, guys. Okay. One what? week. All right. No, that fair. But look what happened the last time I went away for one week. Jesus Christ. That's fair. You have no room to We did it talk. while you were gone. Well, that's we did true. Over the top that's true. You, were, you didn't come back to over the top. No illusions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us, Heath. What will we be breaking down today? We watched the Boondock Saints. <laughs> it's the story of two Irish Catholic brothers getting told by God that they should become vigilante serial killers in Boston. Plus, um, just a whole bunch of bigot stuff that they added since the last time I saw this movie. <laughs> um, must be this weird DVD it's weird. It's really thing. Weird. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. They did like 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 George Lucas did with Star Wars. They went in and added they, some. They put in a lot. I see. <laughs> they put in a lot. I don't know what. Like somehow Bill Burr's inner monologue came to life as a movie, and they inserted it as like a director's cut without telling me. And Eli, how bad was this movie? Real bad, Noah. So bad. Oh yes. Yeah. There's usually a different formula to that, but at a certain <laughs> level of bad, we just have to say but real, real. Other than everything I just said, though, the, there was ah, oh, it's bad. Yeah, it's still <laughs> not great. Well, no, I got a good formula. Here we go. Formula. Uh, well, if you like this movie. You don't. I know you think you do. Yeah. But <laughs> believe us when we say you do not love this movie. So many people wrote to us when we announced this one and said, like, come on, this movie awful. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Like, you know, we're in for a really weird episode when I just take the DVD off my shelf and Heath writes his notes from memory. But... <laughs> But I never, I didn't own this movie because I liked it. I own this movie because Heath was my roommate. I wanted to have like all the movies everybody loved in my movie collection and everybody fucking loved Boondock Saints. It was one of those movies everybody said, oh, you got to watch Boondock Saints. It's going to be great. Right. And sometimes when people say that, hey, you know what? I end up watching Memento or, or fucking Reservoir Dogs. So yeah, sure. Everybody said, and then I watched it and I'm like, this is shit. And this is why I no longer listen to everybody. This movie is the <laughs> fucking reason I'm misanthropic because people told me to watch this movie and said I would enjoy it. Fuck them, it's bad. <laughs> they, they, these people, they watched the original version that I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, same thing. No, I was telling Eli before the record, I feel so good, so vindicated by the 2010s, right? Because that's when everybody realized that everything I said sucked in the 90s. D 
did suck in the 90s. Fucking <laughs> Boondock Saints and Adam Sandler and shit. I was on my own little fucking island back then. Everybody's like, oh, Adam Sandler's got a new movie out. I bet that'll be funny. I'm like, what would make you think an Adam Sandler movie would be fucking funny? Point to a time he was ever fucking funny in his entire goddamn life. Most of that shit doesn't even really rhyme with Hanukkah. And now suddenly everybody pretends that they saw it the whole fucking time. He was one of the highest paid actors in fucking Hollywood. You guys did fucking not. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but marijuana cuz. <laughs> Gin and tonica. <laughs> That's great wordplay. And now he's a seasoned comedian and you can I, find great <laughs> stuff in the Adam Sandler catalog. Yeah. So he, I'll tell you what. I will admit that this is a religious enough movie to count for Gam if you will admit that this is a terrible goddamn movie. <laughs> okay. I it's through Either way, it's definitely a religious movie. Literally, the plot is God is like, <laughs> murder people, I'm God. And they're like, yup, got oh, it. Yeah, that's true. No, it really is. It's way more religious than I remembered it being, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely religious. But we don't need to make a deal about me admitting anything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Done. All right, so uh, is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? <laughs> yeah, so... I didn't know this. I learned this recently. I'm going to go with best worst backstory of the writer slash director, the guy who uh -huh, made this yes. thing, Troy Duffy. So uh -huh. Harvey Weinstein found Troy Duffy bartending in Los Angeles to facilitate his alcoholism. Redundant. He found him bartending and Troy Duffy Somehow sells the script to Weinstein, gets a huge budget from Miramax, and even gets Weinstein to buy the bar for him and make him an owner. <laughs> but then Troy Duffy starts showing up to Miramax meetings with execs, and he's wearing, like, vomit-covered overalls that he was wearing at the bar an hour earlier, and he's yelling at him, and he loses the funding almost immediately. Yeah, apparently in a drunken fight with Ewan McGregor. Well, <laughs> yeah. th that, that also happened, yeah. So he, <laughs> he, he gets other producers to help him shoot it somehow, but he's still hot garbage as a human being, so a whole bunch of actors turned down, including, yeah, Ewan McGregor. They like <laughs> they went out drinking together, and Ewan McGregor was like, oh, you know, I'll think about it, but uh, I'm not really a fan of the death penalty, and Troy Duffy just like screamed at his face until you and McGregor left and he never got to hire him. Yeah. <laughs> but he finally gets it shot and then he tries to sell it himself at the con festival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but that happens in June of 1999, literally a month after Columbine. So everybody's like, no, no, no. Yeah. No, <laughs> right. No. And so the best he could do, he ends up getting like a one week release in like six theaters. He makes no money. But then it gets a crazy cult following from DVD sales. They go crazy, but Miramax had all the rights to the DVD sales in that deal. So Troy Duffy gets like nothing. So just to be clear, Harvey Weinstein ends up being the less offensive person in this business relationship. <laughs> That's the moral of Troy Duffy's story. Oh, yeah. There Apparently, there's a 2003 documentary all about. I have not seen it, but I've heard good things yeah. about like just th this Overnight. guy falling the fuck apart. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I was going to go with that. I know this is a little bit of a letdown after Heath's great big one and everything, but I I've got a short one. Best worst fucking title. Right. What the fuck does this movie have to do with the boondocks? It, it takes place in fucking Boston. Every scene well, is in Boston. <laughs> I mean, Boston is kind of like the boondocks for New York. <laughs> it's well, the boondocks. Of cities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the guys are from maybe like Boondocksy, Ireland. I'd watch the sequel, Noah. Come on. <laughs> okay. <Yeah>. No. <laughs> uh, now, we touched on this already a couple of times, but I was just going to go with best worst recollection of this movie. So, like, mm -hmm. we had a conversation about doing this movie a couple of months ago. And I remember I was like, oh, I liked that movie. Like, right? Oh, so the, you saw that cut, too. Yeah. And we all sat around and me and Heath were like, no, I get it. Like, the angle on the review will be that me and Heath like the movie. <laughs> and you'll be the one who didn't like the movie. And I was maybe four minutes before I was maybe four <laughs> minutes into this movie before I was like, guys, that angle where we like the movie. We're not gonna be able to do I would not like to be associated with liking this movie, please. <laughs> and, and look, if you do like this movie, 
you should not listen to this review of this movie. <laughs> Stop the podcast and turn away. Live in the sweet, sweet innocence you now hold. Because believe me, you do not like this movie and you do not want to be the person who likes this movie. I promise you. <laughs> It's so fucking okay. bad. I watched this movie for the very first time. I was in college. So a couple of years after it came out, I didn't see it right away. And this is one of the first times I hung out with college girlfriend. It was very exciting. It was one of the best days ever. She, she came over. She introduces me to this movie. We smoke a bunch of pot. I guess that made this all possible. And maybe I'm not remembering the. No, no, I was high in the 90s, too. That's the thing. Okay. I was also <laughs> high then. You but, can't blame the weed. We wa so we watched this movie and it was great and like I've I loved it ever since until like you know now but <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking back like I think she might be a giant bigot like I I don't know <laughs> that's the only explanation I don't think she I think she is I don't know we made she made us dress up as ghosts every Halloween and I thought it was just this weird <laughs> thing they didn't even make any sense because they had high holes and horses ghosts don't ride horses. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you what. Heath admitted way earlier than I thought he was going to how horrible this fucking movie is. So it fucks up a few of my written transitions. So with no real transition I whatsoever, back we we're going to take a, bra a brief break here. And uh, when we come back, we'll dive into all the pew, pew, pew that is Boondock Saints. And since that's where our first date was, I thought it might be a nice surprise for Anna. Uh, what about you, Heath? What are you doing for Valentine's Day? Um, has this ever happened to you? Are you a giant pile of garbage on Valentine's Day? Okay. Do you swear it's, that you're going to get around to it and then don't because the three minutes it would take you to overjoy someone else is too much? Well, then you need books. What's books? Books is short for bouquets. B-O-U-Q-S. Not everyone prefers roses for Valentine's Day. The Books Colo has you covered with a variety of beautifully styled bouquets, sweet treats, plants, gifts, and succulents. Okay, but I I'm sure if I just explain that the ecological effects of flower farming are, are like negative. Uh, nope, no, they won't. Besides, Books partners with eco-friendly farms that pay their workers higher on average, minimize waste, recycle water, and use sustainable growing practices. Oh, that's cool, I guess. That's, this that's farm fun. direct transparent sourcing means fresher, longer lasting flowers for you. It's true. They sent me a sample bouquet and it wasn't just beautiful. It smelled amazing. Plus, I got to pretend I ordered it for Anna. Uh, doesn't Anna listen to these shows? I mean, I ordered one for Anna with money is what I, yep. I gave them yep. money. You nailed it. Look, we know our listeners. Half of you will hear this ad. Remember, you need to order flowers or gifts with plenty of time and get 25% off your order from the Books Company by going to books.com slash awful with code awful. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash awful. Yep, totally going to do that. Good stuff. But more importantly, we also know the other half of you are Heath. Okay. And for those of you who are Heath, the Books Co. is nationwide and offers next as well as same day delivery. Okay, so hypothetically... If we did forget until Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can still get 25% off your order from the Books Co. by going to books.com slash awful with code awful. That's B-O-U-Q-S dot com slash awful or check the show notes. Cool. Uh, I'll probably just explain that Valentine's Day is a creation of greeting card companies to sell chocolates and flowers. Uh, yeah. No, that'll go. That's going to go great. Yeah, people love that. I'm going to explain. Sure. Just no, yeah. The economics. A, a man who will explain. Okay, but mom, I need my cell phone for work. I can't just get my own plan because I told you I'm not liquid right now. I, uh, 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 tattoos are a business expense. Hello, it has the phone number on it. Fucking bitch. Dude, <sighs> um, so your mom? Talking to your yeah. mom? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, she sounds like a real bitch. Oh, yeah, super bitch. Yeah, totally. We all call women bitches when we disagree with them, right? Yeah, bitches. everyone we do. who all was of involved us. in the writing of this movie. Anyway, yep. uh, welcome to the first ever writer's meeting uh, for the Boondock Saints. Uh, why don't we just, uh, we'll go around and introduce ourselves first. Uh, I'm Kyle, and my favorite movie is <laughs> Boobs. Boobs. <laughs> 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 like boobs. Boobs. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Ryan, and my favorite food is 
Boobs. I see what you because that, that was a I eat a callback. I eat oh. boobs. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's super you. funny. Okay, right? my name is Mike, uh, and my favorite boobs ha. are boobs. <laughs> oh, well done. You said <laughs> boobs more you times. Said it to, doubled it. Yeah, no, they come in pairs. And so w- here's what I'm thinking for our movie. Um, have you guys seen like um, you know, like Scarface and The Godfather? No. No. Too much talking. A lot of There's talking. A lot yeah. of right. Talking. Bunch. Right. Yes. Same here. Awesome. But uh, do you guys have the posters on your wall? Fuck yeah, I do. It's the only thing resembling art I own. Nice. Nice. I want the movie to be like that. Wait, let me just clarify. You want to make a movie that is like owning a Scarface poster, but not having seen the film. Exactly. Awesome. <laughs> This is going to be great. We're Fantastic. on the same page. Yeah. My Twitter avatar is the Joker. Mine too. Me three. Boobs. It's the Joker with boobs. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown. We're going to open this movie up in a church. And, I, and by the way, I, I open up with this realization. If a movie starts in a church, it's a gangster movie or a horror movie. If it ends in a church, it's a rom-com or a Christian movie. That, I'm, I'm pretty sure that holds up. This I is a know. gangster <laughs> Christian movie. <laughs> it, it is, it is, yeah. But it's much more a gangster movie than a Christian movie. As we know, because <laughs> no Catholic church in the city of Boston would let them film <laughs> the fucking thing in their church. Dude, we're the Boston Catholic Church and you, Troy Duffy, are poisonous. That is yeah, right. <laughs> something that happened. Yeah, I was going to say, this movie is about people that hunt down pedophiles and murderers. I got some bad news about the church they started in. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so the preacher's talking about um, I don't I I like I, I listened to it for a full fucking minute. I immediately afterwards I couldn't have told you what he said with a gun wah, in my wah, fucking wah, head. Wah, wah, right, wah, yeah, wah. exactly. My brain just shuts the fuck down. It's also because the sound editing in this scene is bonkers because we have simultaneously a choir, a priest talking, and an old Irish guy muttering about vengeance. <laughs> simultaneously, <laughs> it's like Thanksgiving at Heath's house. It's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. And by the way, let's just go ahead and explain the the Irish guy that we're hearing in the background is Billy Connolly, who is in this movie, and he's going to be their like uh, he's going to be their dad. That doesn't like spoil anything. And he's given them like the vigilante speech in their heads. But there's a little girl in the pew next to them who looks over at him like like she hears it. She's like, <laughs> does, does anybody else that was, hear that? Do you guys not hear what's happening? Like, those guys are having like a, like a super violent voiceover from, I think, Billy Connolly? He's said <laughs> Billy Connolly? He's from head of the class? These guys are definitely going to murder some people. <laughs> Nobody hears that. So, and I, and I should point out, okay, so like the, the preacher is doing his thing. They go up and they kiss Jesus' feet because Jesus had a foot thing. And I do manage, the fucking preacher pulls me out for just a second. By hitting on one of my trigger words or trigger names, I guess, in this uh, case, because he's the preacher starts talking about Kitty Genovese, the Kitty Genovese. <laughs> urban legend used to make neighbors distrust one another that this movie clearly thinks is real. Well, yeah. not just that, but <laughs> Kitty Genovese is actually really interesting for the opposite reason that this movie and the people yep. who like it think it's interesting. Right. <laughs> right. So like the whole thing is like, oh, this lady got stabbed to death and there were 38 witnesses who did nothing. And that's. All totally made up. Even the New York Times who yeah. published that was like, yeah, no, we saw that on a yik yak. So the reason <laughs> she died actually is because New York City didn't have a 911 system at the time. And so when her neighbors scared off the killer, which they did and called the police, which they did and, and held her until <laughs> she died, like, or, or, or yeah. until the police arrived. Yeah. 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 Her neighbors were very neighborly in this instance. Yeah. All right. But when they did that, they, she was poor, so her neighborhood was given a low priority. So if you think about it, it's not about people listening to a lady get stabbed. It's about all of us listening to America get stabbed. It's very <laughs> useful. All right. You know what? Metaphor. This kitty Genovese story is not working. Have you guys heard of Bernie Getz? That's another good <laughs> illustrative <laughs> New York story. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, yeah. The pastor's basically saying, you know, but if only there were some assassin vigilantes with I don't know, some tattoos probably or something that that would that would really take care of business. 
so they walk out, and this is where I first realized that this is where the dude who plays Daryl in The Walking Dead comes from. I had no idea. Norman Reedus. Yeah, yeah, right. The guy from This and Walking Dead. The two things he did. He's also in the sequel and the in production threequel. <laughs> yeah, in production for the last thirty seven fucking years. Yeah, that one will be out any minute. They're putting a lot of work into it. Yeah, it's like the it's like the it's like a boy's life. Yeah. <laughs> a, yep. Link Troy later. Duffy so, and Richard Linklater are going to do it. Yeah, yep. right, two right. two filmmakers two with a lot in common. Right there. <laughs> All right, but the zombies are fucked. That's the important thing. And then we get some jarringly Irish music as we open up on them showing up to work at a slaughterhouse. By the way, jarringly is an adjective I'm going to be using a lot in my notes uh, today. Also jarring <laughs> the Irish accents of these people. Ooh, oh, they are. Yeah. Rough. Did they get worse since 1999? Again, like I feel like they added worse <laughs> accents in. Yeah, they dubbed over the Lucky Charms mascot for all of their lines. So, so here's the thing: the, the Irish accents are so bad in this movie that when Billy Connolly shows up, he has a bad Irish accent. He does. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> he really? What? I think he was like he didn't want to make those guys. No, he's like, well, I gotta do an impression of the thing that they're doing. So I'll go. Well, what for do that. I sound like? You see, I sound <laughs> like you. Sorry, me, sorry, me, sorry. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so we have to see that, like, they work at this slaughterhouse and they, they're always having some kind of meat shenanigans or another. And everybody just really loves them there. Right. Yeah. And that I think Keith will agree is where this scene ended until sometime when me and Heath were sitting at home minding our own business. Someone <laughs> added this weird yeah. scene about fighting a woman. Because she. Yeah. Right. Because you made a joke about hitting women yeah so we have the, the this this scene where there's this woman okay first of all the whole rule of thumb thing another urban legend bullshit right so he says the, the way the scene plays out is he says well the rule of thumb around here is and she goes rule of thumb well that's a legal rule that used to allow men to beat their wives if the implement wasn't wider than their thumb that's also uh, not true not true no. at all it, it comes from measuring your sh like something with your fucking thumb Right. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking obviously you rule with your thumb. That's what rule of thumb is. Anyway, so they're wrong about that, but it doesn't fucking matter. So then she gets mad because he says, well, I feel like you'd need a bigger implement than that. Yeah. Connor, uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, one of the two brothers, Connor and Murphy are the two brothers. Are you just here. saying Irish names? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Connor's like, oh, we need a rule of the wrist. And like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, relax. Don't just. Don't, don't do that. But like the joke's like, oh, because she's bigger. It, the the actress who's playing this worker that they're talking to is is a larger. Was well, it was just one of those charming spousal abuse in Boston jokes? Yep. God, which they added. Yep. That that ends with him punching a woman in the face. Well, she yep. does kick him in the dick though, and kind of win the fight. So that was nice. But still, doesn't. But then not enough. He. He punches her in the fucking face. Yep. So, and then and the scene ends. They, this is another. They CGI weird, added it. Yeah, they in, add a lot. It's they added it. Good. We never it's liked technology. That. Also, they, so they go home at a certain point, and these two, despite being gainfully employed, live in unimaginable squalor. And that makes, I mean, this is fucking Boston, not Mogadishu, right? Yeah, I wanted them to like turn and their neighbor, the Count of Monte Cristo, is just like, come on, guys, take care of your place. <laughs> Man in the Iron Mask down the hall is having a mixer and you're not invited. Jesus. Yeah, okay. So then we meet the character named David Della Rocco, played by the actor named <laughs> David Della Rocco. God, I love this factoid is everything you need to know about this movie. If someone like jumped out of the bushes and was like, quick, describe how bad that movie is, I'd be like, they had a guy named David Della Rocco and they didn't bother to name his character or anything else. He'd be like, all right, <laughs> you live another day, Muggsy. Back into the yeah, bushes. Th well, this is Troy Duffy's garbage friend from like Hartford, Connecticut. Yep. And he was like, you know who's funny and tells amazing, horribly racist slur jokes in the bar every night when I go to the bar every night? My buddy David Delarocco, and he will get very confused if he's not named David 
Della Rocco in this movie. <laughs> in my head, and I don't know that this is true, but in my head, there was a month and a half of shooting where his character was named Steve and he just stopped to 200 wasted takes later. They were like, fine, his name's David Della Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> And when he gets introduced with his little title card, he's like a member of the mob, but he runs packages for them. Yeah. Like, uh-huh. Are you technically in the mob if you run package? If, like, is there Uber driver in the mob? Like, how low down on the total <laughs> pole? You are the you are the lowest level of mob. But yeah, he's a numbers runner. So yeah, and and okay, so him and the brothers are at the Irish bar, uh, Irishin. And we learn now from the sad, stuttering old Irish guy that he's going to have to close down the bar because the damn it, them Russian gangsters are moving in on his territory. Yeah. And he has a speech impediment. And that's a good 20 minutes of comedy material in this scene, too. Uh, Certainly a good 20 minutes of material. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Uh Or just material. Yeah. They call him fuck ass because he has a cartoonishly ridiculous version of not Tourette's, but that's what they think this Tourette's is. And he says, yep. fuck ass after stuff. So uh, Rocco comes in and he's like, hey, fuck ass, get me a beer. That was like, hele- was that I thought, pretty sure that was funny 20 years ago? I don't know what happened. I don't. It was someone's computer altered my memory. No, I, it maybe heats as well. And I remember now quoting this line, but now I <laughs> realize that was <laughs> a computer. And thing. this Deep guy, fake. this guy, Doc, the bartender, the Irish guy with the, the speech impediment, he's played by Gerard Parks, who is actually yes. Irish from Dublin. And he hates this so fucking much because he has to listen to these idiots do Irish accents in front of him. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you're going to give my character a speech impediment and make fun of it while I listen to your fucking co-stars mangle this Irish accent like they're fucking serial mascots. What is happening? <laughs> Fuck you guys. You can see it in his eyes. Right. And like, this is, he's a good actor. He's in Fight for Life. He was on Fraggle Rock. He's in yes. the gun rush. This is a guy who had been in movies. All right. So, but anyway, so the Russian gangsters show up and they're like, you know, we are Russians and we are here to close your bar down now. We are bad guys. So they spill the Irish guy's beers, which makes it serious, except we cut away from that. We don't get to see what happened. Not yet. Anyway. Right. Yeah. The scene cuts away so quick and so meaninglessly and poorly shot that I literally had to make sure I hadn't accidentally like sat on the fast forward button on my remote. I like, <laughs> right. went back and I, right. no, that cuts too bad. Nope, that's in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So now it's the next day. We're at the scene of the crime. This is where we're going to meet Willem Dafoe. So he's the super FBI awesome cop. So super, by the way, that he shows up in slow motion while everyone else is moving in regular motion. Right? Okay, but but the slow motion is too slow because whoever made this movie doesn't know how to make movies. So it's like, and where every other movie would have been like, great, now the scene oh, starts, man. it's like, he needs to get like 30 <laughs> feet from where he is to the scene. This is uh. long. Oh, I thought by the time he got into the scene, he was going to say it's and start Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> also, the scene he's walking into, do cops just stand around loudly guessing how murders happen? Because that would explain a lot. <laughs> that's, what, they do. that's what they do in the movie. No, they absolutely do. And this, I mean, the guy you're talking about is Detective Greenlee, I'm assuming. Yep. Who is yep. my absolute favorite. That's Bob Marley, by the way. Yeah. That's, Bob Marley is the fucking actor's uh, name. What? A Canadian comedian named Bob Marley. White guy who looks like yeah, his Irish Boston guy in, in this movie. And he's my favorite, though. His character is fantastic. They work <laughs> throughout. Is one, of the, one of the few things I, I still enjoyed that I didn't get tricked by. Uh. And But he's <laughs> everyone I went to high school with right now. He's perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, OK, so. What he's doing is he's standing around trying to piece together what happened at this at this scene, you know, and and, um, (laughs) he's not doing a very good job at all. (laughs) He's doing shtick. Basically, (laughs) he's very much doing shtick. Yeah, he's he just he's like dead bodies on the ground with different bandages. And he's like, so 
the fucking uh, guy hits this guy. I don't know. It, drinking. It's drinking. There's, it's bought. This is Boston. Somebody got drunk and hit this guy and then hit this guy and then hit this guy. And then Willem Dafoe, like, pieces everything together like Sherlock Holmes in two seconds. It's the best. Yeah. Well, but first he does the, again, the one running plot of this movie that we will still enjoy is every time Greenlee's wrong, Willem Dafoe makes him go get food or beverages for him. I However, this enjoy. first time. When he does it, he sends him out for a latte with a twist of lemon. Did they yeah. know what latte meant? They did mm -mm. not. Not possible. No. Uh, I, <laughs> no. Put some lemon juice in my milk hot <laughs> beverage. Yeah. No, this is definitely Troy Duffy. By the way, we're, we're going to explain in a second that Willem Dafoe's character is a gay person. And Troy Duffy is like, I don't know. Gay people. Latte is like a gay coffee word, right? Yep. And, yeah, or oh, gay too. drink word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, also, his um his character William well, Willem Dafoe is Agent Paul Smecker, which I just realized is super clever wordplay. It's small pecker. Switch to reds. Wow, the spoonerism. Yeah. Wow, it is. And I, I guarantee you, they got to Smecker after five hours of cry fighting with the writer of the movie that he couldn't just name him small pecker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Willem Dafoe now is going to listen to fucking opera music on his disc command while he looks around and pieces this all together. It's you know, just in case that fucking one song that Anna insists is several different songs wasn't bad enough to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the gay coding of Dafoe's character in this movie <laughs> is so, so bad. Oh my god, so terrible and absurd. Like, uh, sorry, gentlemen, I know you're getting in a fight. Outside of this TGI Fridays, if I could just break you up for a second and have you name four things you know about gay people, yep. I'm, ba I'm basing an entire <laughs> character in a movie on literally whatever comes out of Latte, your mouth. Latte. Got it. Latte. Lemon. Opera. Opera. Sure. Operas <laughs> are gay? Did you say operas are gay? Yep. Mm -hmm. How many people should use the F slur in this movie? All, all of, of them. them. Got it. All yeah, of okay. them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Wonderful. I'll so, leave you to it. All right, so, and, and then we get the scene where, like, a smacker comes into the police department afterwards to bitch at everybody for tipping off the press about the cool vigilante zombie killers out there. Yeah, and his speech here is like, look, all right, these are not run-of-the-mill criminals. They are just normal heroes. Okay, maybe they're angels. I'm going to call them <laughs> angels, but they're just normal angel awesome guys doing their best stood their ground troy duffy they're troy duffy everybody <laughs> yep well and that's the thing okay so like the only literally the only thing they know about this now is that someone killed some people that's it and they're all like ah oh, that seems pretty heroic to kill people so then uh detective greenlee of course has to end the scene by going well, I bet at the end of this scene, they won't walk into the police department and turn themselves in. And they're That's standing one, right behind you. One thing I, <laughs> yeah. no, I know. They are standing right behind you. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. So now uh, Willem Dafoe takes him into a room to talk to him one on two, I guess. And this is where we finally go back and fill in what the fuck has happened in this movie up till now. Yeah, so we're going to put this memento-esque narrative together because if they didn't cut this movie together like a nerd frantically picking up their books, this is just a movie about <laughs> guys who got in a bar fight that ends in murder who then decide that's a great use of their time. It is four minutes long without right. the use of this weird right, cut right. back like, and yes, forth system. There's been a 12 and a half minute goddamn filibuster in this fucking movie but now we get to finish the fucking fight scene with the russian guys and the only thing that we really learn about this movie, we've we've heard our characters speaking gaelic earlier and now they're speaking russian to the russian guys because apparently they speak all of the languages that there are yeah they're polyglots they're poor slum living meat pack working polyglots yep yeah exactly <laughs> But we go back in time to like right after the Russian guys knock their beer out of their heads and we end up with this completely unchoreographed fight scene. Oh, yeah. Right. It's just jerking people. The most interesting moment of, of, of it is literally a, a slow motion bottle break. That's all they gave us. It's two bottles. They're oh, OK. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. At the same time. On each side of his they head. took out all the cool parts of the scene that me and Heath remembered yeah. <laughs> before we watched it. 
And of course, in the end, they they light the Russian guy's ass on fire. Cause, okay. Yeah. But again, you've got to imagine like there was a moment where they were like, "All right, well, we've won this fight we've had here in this bar. Um, you want to torture one of them? Yep. Seems like a weird <laughs> change in tone for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They light his ass on fire by pouring Hennessy on it and then throwing the match on it. You can't start a fire with Hennessy, first of all. But no. <laughs> why are they drinking cognac on St. Patty's Day? That's weird. <laughs> so, all right. Then the next morning in this flashback, the Russian guys that they beat up the night before break in on them while they're waking up in their slum hovel. And they're like mad that they didn't like lose and go home. They literally complain as they're dragging them away at gunpoint. He's like, this is against the rules of bar fights. You're supposed to just fight and, you know, let us light you on fire it and is, then go. That is the rule. <laughs> yeah. No, apparently. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So they cuff. I have them as bro one and bro two throughout the whole. Occasionally, I'll call the one guy Daryl. But other than that, I, I didn't realize <laughs> they had names. Connor and Murphy. Are their names okay? So I, but I don't know which one is which. So doesn't matter. They okay. So they cut. <laughs> they cuff Connor to the toilet and they take Murphy off to go kill him. Yeah, that is what they do. They, they nail it. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. And this is where Connor then, I guess, rips the toilet off the floor with his Irish anger. Yeah, but mm. not before he sits over the toilet screaming in rage for. A solid 60 seconds. I wrote in my notes, if people want to watch someone scream and strain over a toilet, I've got a potential <laughs> hundreds of hours of footage for this film. I'm just saying. Also, like, there's no way the easiest way around that is to pull the toilet. Like, you could, there's going to be some shit around the back. You're just going to have to, like, pull out some, some, maybe some piping or some tubes or something around the back. Or here's another good idea. Since the guy let you handcuff yourself, why not just not do it correctly? Oh, it's against the rules of bar fights, don't you know? That is also the rules. Code two, section B yeah. says if they come no, to your house, you the light next them on day. fire. But then you have to let you have to do like an honest, an honest handcuffing. <laughs> I guess self handcuff. If, if you do the ass thieves, fire, yeah. it's, it's in a sec subsection. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it's in the ass fire subsection. Yep. I see. If there is a puzzle that Troy Murphy can't solve. We will learn in this movie it is handcuffs. He has a real, <laughs> real problem he doesn't really with know handcuff what those are logistics. Exactly, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. no. But Connor pulls the toilet out of the floor while still handcuffed to it mm -hmm. as his brother's being taken downstairs. And his plan is, oh, you know what? I might as well, now that I'm holding this toilet, use the toilet, yep. right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and, he <laughs> and he's thinking of, I get, he must be thinking to himself, Hopefully these gangsters took my brother directly under our fire escape because I'm going to carry this toilet out to, to the fire escape and drop it on their head. Otherwise, I'm just carrying a toilet. It be they better be like right <laughs> under or else this is dumb. All right. I'm pretty sure that he walked up to the roof first. Wasn't he on the roof at this point? He is on the roof, yes. So he must have walked up a flight of stairs with that toilet while his brother's life is on the line. Hoping that he Being would like, be no, I, very I am nearby. This. I am definitely nailing this. this <laughs> just counting down 2019. They'll probably shoot him at, at yeah, I got this at, at eight. Yeah, I'll, I'll get him at yeah. one. Yeah. So right before they shoot him, he drops the toilet on one gangster and then just leaps from at least six stories up. Right. We, we've established they live on the fifth floor. So it's at least more than that. Just jumps directly onto the other bad guy using that bad guy to break his fall. You see, because. It matters what you fall on. The, who the fuck yeah, knows? It's, it's Looney Tune rules. Whoever's on the bottom is the one that gets hurt. Oh, by okay, the fall. yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, in fairness, these these Russian guys are they have the reflexes of Koopa Troopas, and you can land on them like Koopa Troopas <laughs> safety wise. Okay, all right, that makes sense. And then, to be clear, they rob them and take their guns, like. That's not yeah. a part of the saving your brother's life nope. thing. It kind of puts a damper on that moment, right? Because, like, what this movie wants us to believe is, like, oh, these two brothers kill for the first time just looking out for each other. And then they rob the guys they kill. Well, yeah, and then they, they robbed them. Yeah, right. Took all their shit. Don't want to waste the guns <laughs> and money. Jesus. Also, question on the ass bandage. So they, they lit his ass on fire. And in this scene, which is the day after that, he has a big visible ass bandage over his ass. 
wouldn't you just wear full pants over the ass bandage after you have it put on? You would think. Don't feel like you'd cut a hole into the ass of your pants to show off your ass bandage. No. Go uh-uh. out and get some chaps. Yeah, no, it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> but, but you know what? We're not Russian. So, okay. And then Defoe cuts in at this point to point out that speaking Russian is a really silly addition to the story. And that's when they reveal that they also speak Italian and French and Spanish, which it's great listening to these guys try to speak Italian and French. Every, they managed to destroy every language they allegedly speak. Also, this doesn't set anything up. It never matters. Nope. It no. never has any effect. Troy Duffy was just like, and you know what else? They, s- they speak all the languages. <laughs> For, yeah. Right, right. Oh, and then, of course, the cops have to come in like, hey, the press is here and the press just loves these righteous toilet smashing vigilante murderers. But but, so my question here is, why isn't the story in the press up to this point, two men beaten to death in an alley? Right. Why is everyone getting behind or conversely, why do Bostonians get behind that so much? You know, they're like, (laughs) yes, finally, the deaths in alleys where they belong. What? Well, everything before Spotlight, they just listed the race of whoever had been murdered and they waited and seed to see if there was like some super cool vigilantes who did. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. And <laughs> Russian was a race back then. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, during this fucking scene, as he's questioning him, Nathan Lane literally shows up with a handwritten note asking Willem Dafoe to turn down the gay portrayal a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The, what what acting choice did Willem Dafoe make here? Like I get they he's not homophobia. Hom- okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> there, that's yep, that's correct. Mm-hmm. I guess like he's not established as being directly a gay person yet, but he's definitely being like your friend's body mom. But but you're in middle school, so it's kind of scary. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he's he's doing Elizabeth Taylor as the acting choice. Right. <laughs> So now they're going to wake up in the prison where it's raining, where they both just got a dream message from God. Yeah, it was raining inside the police station, right? I'm not crazy. It was. It is. It yeah. was the dream, but they were awake. But then they're awake and it's not raining in the. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the part where God is like, hey, I just came up with an idea for what we could fill the next two acts with. We really haven't set anything up yet. You guys should go just kill a bunch of people now. <laughs> and they they both do the like speed wake up thing at the same time and like exorcism posture, you know, with the back arched. And they look at each other because they're in, you know, twin beds next to each other where they live in this jail right now. And <laughs> one looks at the other. He's like, did, did God just tell you to start murdering people? Murdering people. Did, yes. yes. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. <laughs> All right. Let's this is working out. Let's do That's that. Pl- that is the plot. Yeah. Okay. So they go out into the, cause they were just spending the night at the prison so that the Russians wouldn't kill them. They weren't really a jail. So they walk out the next morning. The cops are all such big fans of them for their Russian murdering. And they, they, they show them, they're like, Hey, look, man, the media is going crazy for you guys and your murders. They even gave this movie a title. They're calling you the boondock saints for reasons that apparently will be explained in the <laughs> second one. <laughs> Oh, how badly did you want them to be like, why, why do they call us the boondock saints? That doesn't, it's, it's not, I'm also making another move. What? Uh, <laughs> is the press making a sequel? Maybe you've heard of Troy Duffy and his band that is now called the boondock saints. They're pretty great. I don't know. That's a true thing. They were called the brood. Yeah. Now they're the boondock saints. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Check out Hartford Open Mics if you want to ever hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So and now it's time for us to meet the Italian mob boss that Rocco works for, who will function as the movie's main character quite randomly at a certain point. And Ron Jeremy, who is in this movie. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we're going to begin this scene. It, it ends worse than this, but we're going to begin this scene with him complaining that Cancel culture has ruined being a mobster. <laughs> He's like, you can't tell anyone you're going to kill them these days. I'm telling you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, you know, the um, Italian mob boss, Papa John or whatever the fuck his name is. Uh, no, actually, Papa John would be pretty appropriate given the way this scene is going to play out. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Papa John is like, uh, hey, you're uh, a funny guy, according to the movie. Um, you want to bring this to a grinding halt and tell a racist joke to us? <laughs> All right, so Harvey Weinstein and Troy Duffy walk into a bar. You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> and I love, like, okay, so he's telling this terribly, terribly racist joke, but they have to establish he's the good guy in this situation. So whenever he says black guy, the gangsters correct him with the N-word, right? They're like, no, you yeah. don't mean black guy. You mean this epithet. And, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. But he doesn't use that word because because he's a good person. He's a good guy character that tells an incredibly racist joke. The punchline of which is simply, wouldn't it be nice if there weren't black people? But he says black people, so it's OK. Yep. Whoa. Also, like <laughs> the performance while delivering this joke is this actor looking into the future seeing how well this scene is going to play in the year 2020. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. It makes a ton of sense if you picture this guy watching this on YouTube and being asked by his grandchildren why this was a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but you could have just not taken this yeah. job, right, Gramps? <laughs> I am a Coke dealer in a Hartford bar, and I'm quite certain this is, you know, kind of offensive. I don't want to say this. <laughs> All right, so we're done with that. So now it's time for us to cut to the brothers buying guns. And apparently they went to the <laughs> underground gun store that Boston has plenty of, and they gave this guy the take as much stuff as you want amount of money. Mm. <laughs> right? They just You get three handfuls of guns, <laughs> <laughs> however much you can get. Yeah. Yeah, they just show him pay in with all the stuff they stole from those Russian guys. And then the guy goes, yeah, take whatever you want. <laughs> That's a bad system you have there. There's a terrible business. I like the theming, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, great. Your displays are very nice at your <laughs> underground gun shop. Yeah, including <laughs> rope, which they take. Mm -hmm. we, again, you know, if you're getting handfuls of guns by the handful, if that's the policy, gra grab all guns and like buy rope at Home Depot or whatever. You know, you can get rope pretty much anywhere. Yeah, yeah. you can. Or get actually, rope I, elsewhere. Should, I should say uh, rope is how they say it. Rope. Was <laughs> we need some rope. Yeah. 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 They, we spend an awful lot of time talking about the rope. Don't worry. That's going to matter later. So now that our heroes are armed up, I guess they can run off and righteously murder the people that their voices in their head told them to kill. So I'm going to pause for a quick analgesic. But when we come back, we'll break down even more Boondock Saints. OK, light it. Keep it steady. I'm trying. G guys, what are you doing? Oh, uh, hey, no, Eli and I are tooth candling. Yeah, I'm so You are tooth candling. Yeah, Gwyneth mm -hmm. Paltrow says it's great. She does. Yep, Goop Lab. Guys, guys, tooth candling is not going to help you have better dental health. It won't. Then what? Sorry, what's? Then what will? Brushing for two minutes twice a day and flossing regularly. Boo nerd. Two minutes? What? I I know. I know. Why don't you guys just try Quip? What's Quip? Quip makes healthy dental habits easy, starting with an electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and anti-cavity toothpaste. But, like, is it a good toothbrush? It sure is. Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide a full and even clean. The Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked strings to help you get just enough. Plus, Quip delivers fresh brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping, so your routine is always right. Okay, but that's got to be, like, super expensive, right? Actually, you can join over 3 million healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash awful right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash awful, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful. You know what, Noah? That does sound better. I'm in. Quip, the good habits company. Uh, by the way, your beard is on fire. Naturally on fire. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. When we last left our heroes, they were getting guns and rope to go kill people. Yeah, they're just walking through Boston with 
<laughs> matching <laughs> vigilante outfits and giant matching gun bags. Right. Yeah, exactly. Walk right into a fancy hotel. Yeah. I wanted the bellhop to be like, hey, can, can I bring your uh, gun bags to the bad guy's room for you? <laughs> <laughs> Is that where you're going very clearly? <laughs> And of course, we're going to intersperse this. So, like, they all they go off to kill the guys, but then we cut to Willem Dafoe getting the call about them having killed the guys. And he had sex with a guy, which is comedy. It's yeah, comedy. right. No, yeah, exactly. And he and he he calls him names Bepsler. for being gay. Yeah, they added this. Me and Heath didn't like it before they added this scene. I, I, see, I got you. Was wearing a, <laughs> when me and Heath saw it, he was wearing a business suit, and his partner comes in, and they. Picked out flowers for the marriage that they deserve to have together. So, <laughs> it was very pleasant. That's what me and Heath saw. So, and then they changed it when they made the new Gus- Ghostbusters. They changed yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but okay. He shows up at the at the scene of yet another mass murder. And he says, hey, Greenlee, how many people are dead? And he says, eight. No, fuck, it's nine. And he's like, yep, now you have to go get coffee. Now, Again, the the idea here is supposed to be that Greenlee is not very observant and didn't notice things correctly, and Willem Dafoe's character did, but but he didn't notice how many be, he couldn't count to nine is what you landed on for that. <laughs> Why? Because you're a goddamn idiot trying to write a movie where a smart person is smarter than anyone at all. Yeah, Droid Duffy ran out of clever things in his brain, and he was like, "All right." Here's one that always fools me, bottom of the barrel. The difference between eight and nine. You right? know what's always happening to me? Gay people showing me up about counting up to nine. This is constant in my life. There we go. Because it's uh. it's so close to ten. You're so excited to use that second digit. I think no, I think this will be a great is. part of my movie. <laughs> so yeah, so Willem Dafoe is there and he's he's talking shit and being an asshole to everyone because otherwise something in this movie would be pleasant to experience. I don't fucking know. Oh, come on. Him, Willem Dafoe in this scene, he gets up on that ledge of the sunken living room of this hotel suite. And he like, he literally river dances at one point. He's he like, he will not stop chewing the scenery so hard in this movie. And it's fantastic. This is one of my favorite parts where he's walking along the ledge and they're like, hey, can you just fucking step down from the weird ledge while you give the lecture? This is ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah, no, see, I, I agreed with you right up until you started to like, you, you you described it exactly perfectly. And then you said, and it's fantastic or some such nonsense He's at the end. But up until then. Somersaults and backflips for no reason. Oh, it's, it's so, it's so goddamn bad. And then again, like he, he, he has to do the smart guy thing and he's like, okay, well, this guy was shot with two guns in the back of the head. So there must have been two shooters because you wouldn't use two guns. You wouldn't cock your arms up, but you would. Right. Yep. Like that's the only <laughs> way that you physically could shoot someone. Like it would be so hard to lock your elbows and do this. Like the whole movie rests on his Sherlockian dis- deduction, but none of it even adds up. Yeah. And like it's not Sherlockian. It's just random. And I know that this is like a movie trope. The idea of like no one holds a gun like this, but I swear there's a generation of me and Heath who think that like if we just hold a gun upside down and pull the trigger with our pinky, we would commit the perfect crime. Never know what was going on. <laughs> They'd be looking for Spider-Man. Yeah, is there, like an octopus <laughs> killed these guys. I don't know. Well, it's definitely not Heath and Eli. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. I'm going to check the aquariums. Yeah, they're right side up. <laughs> <laughs> the canvas so, aquariums. All right. So now, okay. So now we're going to flash back to the murders, right? We're going to show what really happened. And we cut to these guys like, I guess they crawled through an air shaft a la Bruce Willis. Yep. And also, okay. So the main guy that they're trying to kill is a fat character. Thank you. Yes. His costume. Oh. His costume is high school plays level bed like the pillow is sticking out of his shirt and shifted to the wrong side of his body to be girth it's insane they have just cast a fat guy or barring that made this character not fat (laughs) you're talking about the russian mobster guy yeah Yeah. he looked like george washington in a suit which was it was really fucking weird (laughs) you remember in Geely when al pacino walks in nine tenths of the movie through and shoots someone in the head you know how that wasn't too ridiculous? That's what this costume is. 
All right. So, yeah, so we, we see him and he's yelling at his underlings. And then we cut back to the brothers who are in the air ducts having an air duct fight. And wouldn't you know it, they fall through the ceiling right over the room that they were supposed to be in. And so they just shoot everyone in the room because they're pretty sure that you wouldn't be in a room with a Russian mobster if you weren't also a bad this guy. This is the coolest. They dangle shoot people. And by yeah, the way, right. yes. it cuts immediately <laughs> from this scene to Willem Dafoe literally saying, that's bad TV or a bad movie, Yep, if you will. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he, he realizes that this is just like something that would happen in a shitty movie made by a guy who wasn't trying very hard. <laughs> Which means that at some point he said that line and Duffy, the guy who wrote it, was like, classic, self-aware or not, because it's great. <laughs> what? It would be. <laughs> well, it cuts straight from Willem Dafoe saying, like, this is absurd. It's like TV to Connor and Murph being like, that was fucking great. Like TV, like a movie, like a really good movie. We are in a good movie. Well, actually, they, they kind of go the other way with that because they're like, yeah, in the movies, this is much harder. This is a lot easier. So they actually literally have a conversation at the end of this action sequence where the two characters in the movie are aware that in a movie, this should have been more interesting. Really? Would have thought we'd have gotten more out of that, wouldn't you? <laughs> like that would have been, how long is the movie now? Are we... Uh, uh. And then in one of the more confusing turns in the movie, after everybody's already dead, we're back in the doing the crime timeline now, Rocco shows up also to kill all those same bad guys. <laughs> right? Yeah. So did he get promoted from like guy who brings a sandwich to the big boss to now elite hitman? Is that... Yep. Yep. Off camera, that happened. Like, yeah. <laughs> they were like, that racist joke was amazing. Lots of good slurs. You get to murder a room full of gangsters now. You tell jokes like a man who can murder. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And OK, so he comes in. And of course, the, the brothers are still wearing their ski masks. So they decided that they're, they're going to fuck with him because, you know, it's kind of funny like to see your friend cry like a little baby when you credibly convince him that you're going to shoot him in the face. Kill him. Oh, it's, it's, this classic Frank. Jesus. And then he stands around yelling fuck like as though the writers of this movie believed that if he said fuck enough times, it would automatically get elevated to funny. You know what? Never mind. That's I'm sorry. That is our corporate statement. I'm, I apologize for being <laughs> light of it. I will say now at so many times in my notes, I have written, God, I hope this isn't why people think we're funny. What if this is what pe <laughs> why people think we're funny? <laughs> Turns out Duffy's a huge fan. I thought you guys would get it. Uh -uh. <laughs> so meanwhile, okay, so we cut back to Willem Dafoe and the cops like fucking William the fuck Dafoe the with the fucking cops in a fucking <laughs> crime scene. Fuck. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> fucking boobs. He goes, fuck. he turns to all the other cops and he goes, you know, there are much bigger uh, stakes to these two murders than there were to those last murders, in case anybody was curious. We have escalated now to a much higher level But stakes. But there's not. Nope. Same goddamn thing. He sets up a more interesting movie, and then the movie rejects it. He's yeah. like, you know, this could be a, a turf war between the Russian and Italian mobs. And they're like, or, or, no. or two Irish guys kill people at their whim for another 40 minutes. <laughs> you know, yeah, he tells, like, he gives him, like, an economics lesson. He uses the word glasnost at one point. Apparently, <laughs> glasnost, part of that was deregulating the mafia sector. <laughs> yeah, right, right. In <laughs> Russia. And also, like, Reagan's tax cuts meant a great opportunity for the Russian mob here in the States to yeah, was... not pay as much taxes on their Cash illegal job. I don't know. Ga gangster <laughs> earnings. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then we got, we have a, the scene where like Rocco and the brothers are sitting around like trying to make a list of people they should kill. Right. But more importantly, trying to justify this movie. Yeah. Right. This whole scene is just them being like, I think it'd be fucking awesome if you just went around and shoot people. That's a movie. Yeah. That's a movie. It's absolutely a movie. Right. Well, and there's a disturbing amount of. But you should do it in real life, though. Like, look right over at the camera and say, like, yeah, but really, it would be great if somebody really did this, though, huh? Yeah. Also, a bunch of, like, signaling that he would like them to kill people of color. 
Right. He never says, like, go out and kill people of color. But he's like, so you're saying these gangsters with their baggy pants and backwards caps could <laughs> yes. finally get what's coming to them? Yeah, right, right. No, just like the, the rules at the nightclubs at my uh, right, exactly. in, in my college town didn't actually say no black people in this one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so they substituted it for the they were like, yeah, it's time time to do something about the blacks, you know, like the Italian and Russian mob. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. And, and, and then, so they have this scene where they're all sitting around going like, yeah, drug dealers should be murdered by vigilantes is the premise of this movie. It would be like broken windows policing, except we'd murdered them at the end instead of just put them in prison. So broken windows policing is, I guess, what we're saying. <laughs> well, it was, well, and then there's a moment here where Rocco stops him and he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not just talking about violent criminals, right? We, we're also going to talk about the perpetrators of victimist crimes like drug dealers and men who facilitate prostitution. We're going to kill those people, too, right? And they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you didn't have to add that. Also, <laughs> the makers of this movie should not be anti-drug dealer. You are 14% drugs, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, every scene in this movie is clearly a coke party for these degenerate actors who know Troy Duffy with the cocaine just off camera and every yep. other sloppy thing on a table at a gross coke party is there. That's the, that's like half the scenes. Yeah. And then they have the hilarious scene where they accidentally shoot the cat because otherwise I there would there would have been a level of hatred for this movie that I could achieve that I had not yet achieved. So they killed They're a just cat in it. Ticking off all the Noah's boxes. They okay, we got him sitting up straight. They kill a cat. All right, yeah. Can we get Adam Sandler as a guest star? No, we cannot. <laughs> but we found someone who's just as funny as him to be called Funny Man. Great. That's perfect. That's perfect. Can we get Jennifer Hudson to sing memory? No. All right, what well, Fine. Oh, okay. I have to be honest, it's genuinely scary to me how little I remembered about this movie. Had I been interviewed publicly on the record two weeks ago about this movie, I would have been like, Boondock Saints is fucking great! <laughs> so, I'm afraid of other things that I haven't seen in ten years now. Yeah, you know, I started having that feeling too when I saw you guys' notes on this. I'm like, oh god, what do I think is good that's really fucking I'm bad? I'm gonna delete my entire Twitter just to be safe. I don't know. Yeah, just to be on the same side. I will never like another thing. Be be real with me. Does Barney advocate a race war? Because I remember him just doing that test of the five senses thing, but maybe he snuck it in there after the orange soda. I don't I don't know. All right, so, and then we shift gears here a little bit. We have the, um, God, that cat scene in so abruptly, I thought there was going to be a commercial break in it, in the <laughs> DVD. But then we come back, and the non-Daryl brother realizes that Rocco was getting set up the other day when they said, like, like this movie just, like, tries to have a retroactive plot now. Yeah, this movie pitches plots for itself in itself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, like, the reason they do this is because they're going to switch over from killing Russian mobsters to Italian mobsters. The only reason I can assume that this happens is because they ran out of quote-unquote Russian mobsters and they were like, well, we, we have Ron Jeremy and that other guy and we could, put, <laughs> we could put different shirts on some of the extras from the Russian mobster scene. And have them do different accents. Sounds... Then we'd have another 10 minutes of movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, but they're trying to convince Rocco of this. He's not buying this. They set him up to be killed. He's still pretty sure that his gangster buddies are good people. Yeah, they love him. It's unclear. But but he's not, though, right? Because then he goes then he goes and kills them. I, OK, so sometime later, uh, the brothers are hanging out, apparently, at Rocco's girlfriend's place. And then his girlfriend shows up and she's a drug addict, which is funny, I guess. Is what humor? She's humor. a noisy dame. You know, noisy dames. They added this too. They added this scene with the CGI. Oh, okay, thing. good. Glad to hear that this wasn't in the version that you guys liked. No, definitely um, not. None of the things that <laughs> happened with this character were in me and Heath's version, to be clear, ever. Yeah, so so Rocco bursts into the fucking room and he's like he's like, "Hey guys, there was another action sequence that we're going to fill the blanks in on later, but right now we need to get the fuck out of here, but not before I 
you know, fucking jump into a goddamn phone booth and turn into super misogynist for a bit and yell at this female character that we haven't met about what a bitch she is. Yep. And what a slut her friend is. Yep. Also, why does he pack an iron when he's frantically packing? These are great questions. Great questions. That one actually gets answered later in the movie. But yeah. What was the point of this scene? Like, yeah, real talk. What was this scene when we watched it? Right. We're better now. We're better now. This but wasn't in think? the movie. <laughs> OK, wasn't in the movie. Never mind. I, we're sticking to our guns. I agree. Classic comedy. <laughs> I, well, OK, so he stands there pointing a gun at some chick who's, whose house he lives in, whose apartment he lives in. Right. So he's the deadbeat boyfriend here pointing a gun at this woman after having killed her cat. This is an explanation of why her fucking cat is dead. Right. And I wrote in my notes at this point, like, I want every character in this movie to get killed except Defoe. And it's not that I like Defoe. He just his character hasn't done anything worthy of getting murdered. So I just want him to get really bad splinters several times or something. (laughs) So now it's time for us to flash back to Rocco's like action scene where he, I guess, killed a bunch of gangsters, too. Yep. So, you know, he walks into a fucking diner in slow motion again because you have to put some shit in slow motion. Otherwise, the movie is an hour and 10 minutes long and we notice that nothing happened in it. Mm-hmm. Just the fucking the lyrics to the goddamn song that are playing in this scene are literally somebody saying something's happening here. <laughs> Go back. Watch this fucking is as if to assure me. This, and I believe, by the way, that we're listening to Troy Duffy's band at this moment. Too. Yeah, this was not Buffalo oh. Springfield. No, this is the Boondocks <laughs> yeah, exactly. band. Uh, formerly the Brood. <laughs> During this scene, I grew a new theory, which is that this movie was like everyone working on it who has talent or taste thought that it was going to turn out to be one of those like mob cautionary tales like Goodfellas or Scarface. And Troy Duffy just never shot the moments of awareness. Where it's a cautionary tale. (laughs) That's where it turns out that any of this was a bad idea. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so we watch Rocco shoot some people in a diner because they set him up, I guess. Yep. I don't fucking know. But yes. And and then that we have the scene where they're all sitting in a car together going like, well, we could just you know, kill more people in the third act. And the other guy's like, yeah, okay. That seems like (laughs) they might as well go. So what do you guys want to do for the rest of the movie? (laughs) Well, this is where Rocco is like, all right, so like, who do we kill next? Cause that's what we're doing now. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And Connor's like, uh, we didn't, we don't really have a system. Um, kind of thought God was going to like check back in. Uh, <laughs> he has not. And get like a list or something. No. Yeah. And well, and then Rocco says, oh, that's great. I know a lot of bad guys. We could kill everyone I know. <laughs> but not me. I am not a bad guy. I, I know all the bad guys and I worked for and with them. Yeah. Don't think about it too much. We'll just kill all the people I know. <laughs> Jesus. And that's when we get the line, I'm strangely comfortable with it in a terrible Irish accent, which is like famous. Now. Like I, there was another amazing line in my memory. Like uh, you guys ruined this for me. Why would you make me watch this again? <laughs> Why did they, they changed it with all the things had great stuff. Don't worry. I'm sure there was a firefight. It's still going to be great. Heath, we're holding out for that, there was a fire. That is locked in forever. That will be it's going to no, be it, wonderful. It's by far we the will worst sing it together in, in harmony. Be, thank you. Movie. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Apparently, Heath has some issues to deal with. So we're going to pause for another break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Did this movie think the 90s weren't imprisoning enough people? Why do so many drug dealers accept drug dealer as the default movie bad guy deserving of death? Weren't you a drug dealer when you first fell in love with this movie, Heath? Find out the it's answers to one of these successful. questions or fewer when we return for yet more homicidal conclusion of... Boondock Saints. He was also a lunch lady. I was. <laughs> Lou, 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 doing Noah stuff. Noah stuff is my favorite stuff. Hey, Noah, what what you doing? Br- Bryce Blankenagle? What, what are you doing here, man? You Usually Eli would walk in to start this sketch. No, uh, well, today I'm Eli's meat double, you know, kind of an orgasmo type situation. Meat double. Yeah, that's right, because this week's sponsor is ButcherBox. 
Wait, what's what's Butcher Box? Well, Butcher Box is the most affordable and convenient way to get healthy, humanely raised meat. I love meat. I know you do, Noah. And ButcherBox knows good meat. And right now, just in time for the big game, ButcherBox is giving God Awful Movies listeners free wings for life. W- wait a second. Free wings for life? You mean like to somebody who wins a contest? No, or? <laughs> not quite. Anyone who signs up for ButcherBox gets three pounds of wings in every box for the life of your subscription, plus $20 off your first box. So wait, no entry fee, no special condition. I just get three pounds of wings in every butcher box I order for the life of my subscription. That's awesome. Indeed it is. ButcherBox delivers 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef, free-range chicken, heritage breed pork, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon directly to your door. All their meat is humanely raised and never given antibiotics or added hormones ever. All right, Bryce, how do I sign up? Well, right now you can get free wings for life plus $20 off your first box. Just go to butcherbox.com slash awful or use promo code awful at checkout. Okay, that's butcherbox.com slash awful or use promo code awful at checkout. Butcherbox, you heard it right. Free wings for life. Wow, that's a great, that's a genuinely great deal. Yeah. So so where is Eli anyway? Uh, he- He's crying in some tofu. Crying in tofu, yeah. Yeah, checks out. I didn't say I liked it. I didn't I'm say that. Pretty sure you said you liked I it. I did not. Hey guys, wait, what's going on? Eli is falsely accusing me of having liked this movie at one point. You Lying. totally said you liked no. this movie. No. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that too. Um, you know, there's all the sexism and the racism and the homophobia. There's no way I like this movie. Absolutely not. Okay, Heath, I just ran a control F of your Facebook. You call this movie Awesome Sauce 33 times. As um, I probably got hacked. Okay, there's a bunch of photos in an album titled Boondock Sates Themed Birthday. Dude, you are definitely an adult in these pictures. It's deep fakes. Do you guys know about that that term deep fakes? It's a lot more common than you think. They deep fake the birthday. Okay, but your first line in our notes for this episode is, man, I love this movie. I've always loved it, and I always will. You wrote that. It, look, Heath, a lot of us grew up liking problematic things or problematic people. That's why there were so goddamn many of them. It can be upsetting to revisit how much we like something that, looking back now, is clearly harmful. But you move on. You work to be better, and you acknowledge that the reason we were allowed to like those things is because it was easy for us to ignore racism, sexism, and homophobia when it didn't affect us. It doesn't make you a bad person to have liked this movie, but it does offer you a chance to be better now. Okay. Or or I could start a YouTube channel and slowly turn into a Nazi. Or that. Yeah, that is an option. Or quickly. So here's the thing about the Jewish question. Okay. Yep. And we're back for still more of this shit. When we last left off, our heroes were deciding to kill someone. uh, Odd numbered scene. And now it's time for them (laughs) to kill that person, but splice together with Willem Dafoe, piecing it together. Even numbered scene. (laughs) Now, this time we're going to be killing Ron Jeremy. Jesus Christ. This every scene in this movie is like you're playing Clue. Right, where this time yep. we're gonna kill Ron Jeremy at the strip club with the gun. With the rope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, first we have to get like Rocco masking incorrectly. That's pretty silly. <laughs> he didn't do the he didn't do the cutouts of his, his ski mask correctly. Do, can you buy ski masks without going on a watch list? I feel like that nobody's just like buying black ski masks for skiing, are they? Nope, nobody. Also, are we supposed to believe that this Rocco character bought a ski mask and then cut eye holes around the eye holes so he would... Dude, are you cutting holes in the back of the... Th- it already has them. What are you doing? You got them. <laughs> All right. All right, that would actually be pretty fucking funny if he turned around and his hair sticking out yeah. of eye holes and shit like that. But, <laughs> but again, this movie, that would take way more clever than this movie yeah. has. I was going to say, way too good. They And they make the reference to... um. Fat Albert here, right? They're like, yep, well, you look yep. like fucking Mushmouth, which is wrong, actually. He looks like Donald, who has the the hat over his face. Okay, yep, yep, yep. And and then they, 
Connor says, you sure you're going to be OBKB, which <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a Bill Cosby reference. And well, a Bill Cosby reference aged better than most of the other lines in this movie, which is real sad. <laughs> and we should point out, this movie grinds to a halt for these jokes, right? Oh, this yes. Is, just everyone stops and he's like, are you sure you're going to get ready? Here comes the joke. Oh, slightly better pacing than the racist one at the beginning, but only a little. <laughs> like this movie is kind of, it's that kid in school that would turn to you and say, check this out. I'm going to say something funny before saying something funny. Right. That's right. this goddamn movie. That's that's who wrote this fucking movie. That guy, he eventually got out of fucking elementary school. It took a while, but then he made this goddamn movie. So, yeah, so they, they kill Ron Jeremy. And oh, also, by the way, I learned this reading through the fucking IMDb trivia. The other two guys that they kill in this scene, the two random people that just happen to be at a strip club who they shoot. There are cut scenes where we introduce who these two characters are. Oh, they're just like other bad guys. Yeah, there are other bad guys. There's a scene in the hospital where they see the one guy beating his wife or something. And then there's the other guy as a a drug dealer that they saw outside the club. But all of that shit gets gets cut. So we're just like, yeah, Ron Jeremy's getting shot for being a gangster. And these other two are getting shot for masturbating. I don't know. We're doing the right thing. It's very clear to everybody watching this movie that this is the, the good message. We're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. And holy fuck. Again, you know, th this movie is relying on, you know, what it seems to think are action sequences. But we just watch forever as these guys spin around shooting at mirror or at windows it's like paintball with a douchebag the movie yep right like they might as <laughs> so well just paintball? be doing dive rolls <laughs> <laughs> they might as well just be doing dive rolls back and forth unnecessarily yeah right <laughs> right why are you doing the military crawl there's really no reason for that you're the only, <laughs> only one with a gun stop that if Dwight Schrute became an incel, <laughs> he would write this movie. <laughs> Jesus. And so and then, of course, we've got this is intercut with uh, Willem Dafoe piecing it all together. And he's angry because he learns at this point that three guys got killed at that diner and they didn't call him in on that one. And he didn't get to, like, douchily flutter about the coffee shop as well. Well, I love, he's like, uh, that's relevant, just FYI. All murders are going to be relevant to this murder trail that we're following. Just let me know about all the murders <laughs> that happen in this city for the next week. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, if you guys tell me about all the murders, I will stand at a reasonable distance when I talk to you. Is that a way of a deal? <laughs> <laughs> we do, Willem Dafoe. The actor. Yeah. All right, so meanwhile... Sally McBride with Channel 22 is starting to get into this whole murder thing, right? <laughs> right? So, yeah, murdering bad guys is going great today in Boston. Um, oh, I was thinking, okay, who wants to start a lynch mob? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just uh, at Sally McBride. I'm Sally McBride. <laughs> so, right. It, it was at this point that I it, it occurred to me. This is like what would happen to a superhero movie if you took away the superpowers and the heroism. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right. So we get some more. But now we're at the fucking coffee shop. We get some more lazily written hack Sherlock Holmes bullshit from Willem Dafoe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was super distracted during this scene because right behind him is the list of fresh juices that this bar sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This... This was actually shot in Toronto. So it's just like this nice, happy bar with like juice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be. A, but I, again, like we saw the guy who ran this bar and the mobsters that inhabited it. So I love the idea of a scene we missed there where, where they were like, Tony, come here, come here. What's it going to take to get a papaya juice around here? Huh? <laughs> a mango, <laughs> strawberry, banana smoothie? Oh, maybe? Sprinkle bee pollen. You guys got bee pollen. Oh, <laughs> acai? Is it pronounced so, acai? I was always saying acai. Wheat germ? Okay. <laughs> so now that we, we, we cut over to current mob boss, right? Joe Papa John's. And Papa John is going to the old retired mob boss because he <laughs> needs a super assassin. Now, keep in mind, he hasn't tried a regular assassin yet. Well, right? He goes straight to the like, 
super assassin that has to be broken out of prison that the other uh, like mobster is like, oh, you know, be careful working with him. He's a monster. It, but it's like we haven't. It seems like we could have just gone with regular strength before extra strength is all I'm saying. <laughs> it goes straight to the force push. If you've got a magical murder, murderer, murder. Okay, guy, yeah, no, you're. That's true. Like, that's true. That's fair. Use him. Finally, a movie does that, and I give him shit for it. No, you're right. So this is where we meet Billy Connolly's character, super assassin Il Duce. Yeah, and he looks like Desert Island Sean Connery. It is not <laughs> what they were hoping for. Yeah, you know, it's hard to make Billy Connolly look intimidating, so they didn't bother to try. Why would you even try? It's not going <laughs> to happen. <laughs> He I looks know. like Billy fucking Connolly. He looks like somebody that you kind of want to hug. You do. You really do. I read that they actually, <laughs> Billy Connolly got so excited about being kind of like badass in this movie all the time that they had to give him a cigar at all moments yes! so he wouldn't beam smile throughout every scene where he's supposed to be badass. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to put a cigar in his mouth. But th this is where they like pull him out of jail like Hannibal Lecter, like it's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> they they roll him on a dolly. Why would you mm -hmm. be rolling him on a dolly? What what was that preventing? For, I don't for the know. security, you see. <laughs> well, I guess they figured, you know, the bite mask was scary or something bigger must mean you're even more badass. I don't know. Yeah. He, his feet weren't in shock. He he could have been nope. walking and they were just like, "Oh, roll him though." Cuz then you know, he'll if he tries to run, he'll slip like a cartoon. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> <laughs> he'll have to skateboard. An old man can't skateboard. Yeah. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Some of them can. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, meanwhile, uh, Rocco has an idea who they can kill next, which is not the first time that the plot of this movie has moved forward because one character just turns to another character and says, you know what we could do in the next few scenes? Right. Wow. This is um, <laughs> I'm going to admit this this next one, this next scene, totally unmotivated. But um, I know a murdery <laughs> murder guy who can sure murder. <laughs> yes. Now it's time for him to introduce silly oversized trench coat guy that they need to kill. Odd, <laughs> odd, odd numbered scene. Yeah. Well, what's what's crazy is he's introduced as like this ruthless assassin who has a poker game. Well, but OK, but here's the thing. We're supposed to believe that if you go to this poker game, you are necessarily also evil. Right. They go in and kill everyone at this fucking poker game. So no matter what, if you go to a poker game with a a, a murderer, you are a killer by proxy. I yeah, guess. It's just like a pizza guy in there. Like, no, no. Yeah. OK, can I just <laughs> before you do the gunfight? <laughs> Prince Andrew's in there. I am too honorable. I was breaking up. I was with coming this. over here to tell him that I couldn't Murder be guy. in this poker game. So, <laughs> also, when we introduce this guy, the trench coat guy, he like silently murders a whole fucking family, and then he's this is just to be like, "Yep, we are morally correct about everything we're doing in this movie." Yeah, mm -hmm. and then he takes Rocco. This is a flashback to Rocco meeting this this crazy cold guy. He takes Rocco with him to like then burn that entire family in a dumpster, all their corpses. Yeah. And so <laughs> he lights the dumpster on fire and they just like stand there watching it for a while. And like you Rocco's like, all right, so we just watch do we watch the, the corpse fire till it's out? Or like right, stop. <laughs> no talking. Sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Are we still well okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I get in on your poker game? <laughs> All right, so now at this point, I guess even this boring ass fucking movie realized they've gone back to the well on the forensically reconstruct the crime scene and then go back and do the crime thing. So now at this point, this is where they're trying to reconstruct the kill the trench coat guy, and Willem Dafoe is just going to walk through the action scene saying what happened and shit. Yes. And in between sentences, Willem Dafoe somehow goes on a three day bender. He comes in dressed as an adult and then like shot to shot, he's suddenly untucked and scraggly with a seven day beard. Yes. My my pet theory about this movie in this moment became that Willem Dafoe knew how fucking awful this script was and was like, OK, I'm going to do this movie as it deserves to be done. That's my performance. Yeah, right. No, that's a great way to describe the performance. Sure. Or he actually hung out with Troy Duffy in real life. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So they go in, they, they kill everybody at this poker game, but trench coat guy was taking a shit during the massacre, so they didn't get him. Unfortunately, none of the three of them are smart enough to realize that the various doors in that room lead to whole different rooms with other people, potentially. <laughs> but don't worry, they, they Rocco beats the guy to death with a cue ball eventually, and, well, and that's that. He beats him to death with a cue ball because the two brothers, they are like struggling, and the two brothers don't intervene. They're just like, ah, no, just let this play out. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll right. find out if God's on our side or not. He is. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. But ju then, just when they thought this action sequence was over, Il Duce is in the movie, too. Now, this is the part <laughs> that apparently he really does a, 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 intend to defend. This is the <laughs> there was a firefight moment. I'm sorry, Noah. There was a the firefight! Fight! Is the line. <laughs> yeah. It does not hold up. Oh, this no, is amazing. And it was Willem never Dafoe is good. Willem Dafoe is conducting the movie like a maestro at this point, and it is so fucking beautiful. Like, he needs to be a guest maestro at the, like, the Boston Pops to do this soundtrack. <laughs> so, like, I would go see that. He is amazing in this moment. Now, oh, Keith, God. be honest with me, because I know I had this experience. I definitely remember this firefight not being everyone in the movie standing a foot and a half from each other, <laughs> firing infinite amounts of bullets with stormtrooper-like accuracy. That is, is, is another deleted... That is the whole fucking scene! They, they, this, they this spliced the in some Star Wars after 1999, clearly. This, this was the goddamn pinnacle action sequence of the movie, and it's just three guys shooting at one guy and one guy shooting at the other three. No one takes any cover. No one moves in any way. Okay, to be fair, to be fair, Willem Dafoe firing a gun into the sky for no what? reason was the greatest thing in the movie. Like, it's so... Good. He's kind of in the scene, kind of not because they haven't decided. And at one point, he just gets down on one knee like Iron Man, like he just landed and then fires the gun that he clearly snuck into this scene and just <laughs> fires it into the air. And they're like, all right, man, we have to keep it. I don't know. Oh, so. it was gratuitously stupid. So, so, <laughs> so incredibly stupid. Like, it's rare that something this mainstream manages to be this stupid and stayed in our hearts and minds for this long. You wow. could have put a gun to my head and been like, describe the Il Duce shootout. And I would have been like, oh, it's really awesome. I'll tell you what it's not. That scene from The <laughs> Office where everyone does a Mexican standoff and dies, but serious. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not that. I'll tell you, tell you right now. Oh, it would have been so good if right after Defoe shoots into the air, they just like, pan out and all the other cops are like hey man what the fuck are you doing did you just fire a gun, <laughs> a gun? <laughs> into the air in suburban Boston you're under arrest now yeah. you, better, you better hope there's a black guy up there otherwise you're in trouble <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Boston so, alright yeah well so okay but but Defoe's character loses his shit starts you know, rolling around in the bushes in anger. And this is where he finds Rocco's finger. Rocco got his finger shot off during the firefight. And so he finds the finger and hides it in his pocket. <laughs> what does he plan to do with this finger? It It is the only explanation for this moment is that he is thinking to himself, well, I do eventually end up on their side later in the movie. <laughs> This will be a real hang up for my character at this point. Jesus. I think that is what they're saying, though. I think he's turning now and he's like, all right, I'm going to help clean up the crime scene for them. I see. OK, because he, he uses this. He uses the finger to, like, secretly find out who they were. He, it's, it's Rocco's finger and he fingerprints it and, you know, puts it into a scanner or whatever. But I think he's already decided at this point that he's going to become a, a good guy. 
Well, then why with the rolling around in the bushes shit seconds before that? Why not to have To throw that? you off the scent, Noah. I, to oh, throw you oh, off the scent. Oh. To fool no, the Noah, fucking viewer to into fool thinking the audience, something yeah. else. It's dramatic irony backwards, <laughs> not at yeah. all what I said. Heath's, Heath's got a great point. No, he does a bad performance this whole movie so that he can do a good performance as Green Goblin it's the perfect Spider-Man. <laughs> art crime. It's it's the second best crime next to holding a gun upside down when you shoot someone. Yeah, right. No, it art crime is the right fucking term though. Um so okay, so now we we stumble home from the encounter with Il Duce with the brothers and Rocco and this time they tie in he has the iron which they use to cauterize their various wounds. Remember? We packed that earlier. Yeah, but that they don't. It's not used as an iron. They're, they heat up the iron on a stove on a yes. range because an iron is the only metal thing you could use on a stove to heat up <laughs> that they could think of. So he has to grab the iron for this moment. Do just criminals mm-hmm. do that? They keep an iron for this. Yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta, well, you were a drug dealer. You should know. That's also not how like <laughs> cauterization works. Now you just have a bullet wound and a burn. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I love too how like like each of the characters gets has one wound that has to be iron cauterized so that they could all be tough in this moment or whatever. I like I just imagine all three of these the, these actors sitting around going like, no, no, I want my, my character can handle it. My character would just like grit. All right. Well, now I have a burn that's infected. Maybe we could steam it. <laughs> Does anybody have a steamer? <laughs> Oh, that just burned me. Does anybody have a like a Gwyneth Paltrow laser kettle thing? Maybe yeah, an that's electric. What we need. Yeah, exactly. Someone could shock my burn steam. <laughs> so okay, so now now we have to really like spell out the whole Willem Dafoe is is on their side and they're on his because this is where like they see him on TV saying, "Yeah, no, we're gonna catch the people doing all these murders." And Rocco's like, "We should kill that guy." And they're like, "No, nah, no, nah, man, he's like he's like a main character. Like he's we're we're cool with him." And at the same time, this is when. Defoe fingerprints Rocco's disembodied finger <laughs> using a mini fridge and a copier from 1993. Oh, yep. Do you mean the washing machine computer that he has? <laughs> <laughs> yep. He does that. And he's like, David Della Rocco is what popped up on my FBI thing. That has to be wrong. That's um, <laughs> that's the actor's name. That's- <laughs> <laughs> what? What's happening here? Yeah, my, def- my detective Defoe in this fucking movie, guys. Come on, yeah. And also, okay, so we see him like afterwards. He's at the uh, at the gay bar, and he's like being snappy with his waiter, and you know, being an asshole. And now I just want I just point that out because like now I'm okay with his character getting killed. Now there's no one in this movie that I don't want to see violently killed before it's uh, before it's all over. And what the author of this movie thinks a gay bar is is fantastic because it's just a bar right and then this self-hating homophobe walked through and was like i bet they have fucking flowers and opera peanuts lattes opera. I bet with lemon <laughs> lattes with lemon can, in them. can we get lattes everybody's with counting lemon. to nine correctly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's an opera singer performing at this gay bar. That's what there is. Jesus. But yeah, this is clearly Troy Duffy being like, "Well, gay people can only drink at gay bars." This is right. Yeah, exactly. Well, right, right. A bar in which a gay person is drinking is then de, de facto a yeah. gay bar. Yeah. I mean, I thought I thought that to myself, but then I was like, "It's Boston in 1999. That probably is the law. I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now the McManus brothers go to church to remind our listeners that this is god awful movies that you're listening to. That that's the that's the podcast there, and this is such a bizarre goddamn fucking scene. I had so much trouble figuring out anyone's motivation in real time. Like after the scene's <laughs> over, it all makes sense, right? But like unless they know how the scene plays out, nothing anyone does makes sense. No. All right, we're gonna need all these car- real people to read this script of real life <laughs> that we're gonna be in our lives have and go. So, all right, so Willem Dafoe, a non-Catholic person, is going to go to a Catholic confessional to say whether or not he's on the McManus brothers' side, which Rocco has intuited, uh-huh. right? <laughs> so he's gonna break into the confessional. 
and hold a gun to the priest's head rather than just, you know, listening in at the other side or whatever so that he can hear what happens. Right. But Murphy O'Shannis O'Connor O'Shea, he's holding <laughs> Rocco. <laughs> And, um, it's like a movie scene, but with more guns is how I imagine Duffy described this script as he was handling <laughs> it to someone. Also, just in terms of the geometry, this just occurred to me. Are confession booths like nested up like that? Where like there's a conf- <laughs> do you go in to confess to the priest and then the priest could confess to a higher priest in the booth behind him? Or, during or just, that yeah, does he like, have, is that like the guy he has to call in? Like He's like, oh, wow, that's a tricky one. Let me check with and my And then manager. like HR is like a booth behind that. <laughs> to be fair, this is Boston in the 90s. It probably makes sense to have your priest immediately confessing then, everything yeah. to a person behind them. <laughs> And then the Boston Globe has a, with a fifth one behind all that, and they're listening in. Yeah. Yeah. But but the key, though, is after all of this Russian nesting dolls of people with guns to each other's heads, Willem Dafoe says that he's okay with mass murder now and wants to, you know, be on their side. Yeah. Gee, if only one of them were in this confessional booth, then that would help. Yeah. He, say, he says to the priest, he's like, all right, well, I want to do, like, evil stuff to help God. Uh, you guys like totally do that, right? That's your thing. And the the priest has to kind of answer honestly. He's like, "Well, we don't we don't normally do murder, if that's what you mean but anymore, <laughs> anymore. We don't anymore, you know, yeah, do murder anymore. But if God told you it's cool, then yeah, that is what I would say. Yes, Jesus. There, w- one line I wanted to highlight in particular: the priest at one point, because because Willem Dafoe's not religious in this, and he's kind of making fun of the priest. And and the priest goes like, look, it's very easy to be sarcastic about religion. And I'm like, hey, motherfucker, your job is the one that's easy, okay? <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. It's harder than we're making it look. Yeah. And Willem Dafoe clarifies, too. He gets the answer of like, yeah, I mean, if God talked to you, I technically can't argue with that, can I? <laughs> Fuck. And, and then Willem Dafoe's like, okay, did not expect that. But okay, one more time, just to be perfectly clear. <laughs> I am going to join a vigilante death squad. God is cool I heard with that. You. Yep. I need you to say yep. yes or no. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right away. You said yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We should stop making me admit it, but we are, you're not misunderstanding me. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So now, I guess one scene later, Willem Dafoe is their commissioner, Gordon, and they're working together to find Il Duce, apparently. Right. Yeah. Oh, or also, they're going to kill Papa Joe tonight. Oh, right, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's Papa John from earlier in our episode. Yeah. So they're going to kill Papa John. And we and they learn. Uh, so fucking Willem Dafoe goes to see bathroom attendant retired mafia done, because why not bring that character back in? And he learns at this point that all the main bad guys are going to be in the same house at the same time tonight. And they're going to get the drop on the, you know, the McManus brothers. And then, and I cannot emphasize this enough, we cut immediately to them having got the drop on the McManus brothers. But once again, we're going to skip over the action scene and just be like, ah, it would be cool. Something action-y happened there. We we never revisit that, by the way, though. It's not not like the framing in this movie. It's just like Duffy started to watch them film what I assume was a minute and a half of characters walking into a building. And he was like, dude, fucking boring. Let's just go to the part where they're shooting off Rocco's fingers. <laughs> yeah. So the scene starts with them being like, oh, my God, that last scene that we won't show you was amazing. We just. Yeah. That was so fun. Yep. So, yeah. So they they fucking they shoot off another one of Rocco's fingers because, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah. One of the mafia guys was this Joe Yagavetta, the like the boss guy. He he's the one who yeah, Papa John, yeah. yeah. He walks in and he's like, "All right, I'm going to get information out of them, I guess." And he points the gun at Rocco's finger, and Connor starts yelling. He's like, "Rocco, look at me! Look at me!" Uh, oh, okay, you're looking at me. I didn't have a follow up. I thought, all right. <laughs> uh, he he shot your finger off. Yeah. <laughs> well, you knew, you knew he just did that. Well, yeah, no, you no, felt well, it. Yeah, thought I would have words of comfort. Don't say anything <laughs> now. All right. So and then so the bad guys go out. They have a quick bad guy huddle, and then they come back in. And Papa John is like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot Rocco and kill him at this moment." By the way, when they shot and killed Rocco, and the two brothers freak out, 
Anna, who was watching this next to me, goes, why do they care about him? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. He's just like one of the guys they would have killed had yeah. he been at that poker game. She could have been saying that about any character in the movie. Pretty That's much. fair. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, and then, like, the the movie expects us to take this seriously or so. I don't know. But then, like, all the bad guys are like, oh, fuck, uh, Billy Connolly is still in this movie. We have not wrapped that up at all. Which is, they become afraid. They're like, oh, man, the Duke will kill us for killing the guy he wanted to kill. <laughs> that we hired him to kill, yeah. It's like they can have, like, a radio or something and be like, oh, we're not doing the murder thing now. Just don't. Okay, you, but you, you would think you would set that up. But yeah. that's the part of the plot here is like, all right, well, you know, old man murder is in the bushes and we cannot stop him from his murder mission. I'm going to take off. You guys deal with this. Cool. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Also, by the way, Il Duce doesn't even mean the Duke. It, it's, it's Mussolini's nickname and it just yeah. means the leader. Which they are not aware. Of. Oh, really? I, th- I thought it was. I thought it was the Duke. I think, all my jokes later, where they found out is that he's their dad, and I don't know whether to call him barons or viscounts. Make no fucking sense now. So thanks no. for ruining that. <laughs> <one>. <laughs> I think Duke is just like you'll Duke. Like they were kind of close, but yeah, they didn't even try. So all right, and and then we cut to so the bad guys are trying to figure out what they're going to do about Billy Connolly. The brothers, meanwhile, are downstairs escaping. They have apparently handcuffed them. But like to ha- chair legs in chairs that aren't fastened to the ground. I don't know. OK, they, they, that's how their legs are. They, they just like literally get out of it by lifting their chairs up off the ground, like slowly. Right. Like the fourth grade teacher was going to get on to them for it. Like that's the moment. Right. They're like, oh, my God, you could totally fall over and break your skull doing that. Oh, they're so brave. And then <laughs> it's like here. Hold up this stick, great, and handcuff your other hand to that stick. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't, right. no cheating. You have to keep holding the stick. That's the law. <laughs> but also, there's a moment I didn't quite get because they have handcuffs on their hands as well. Is there a point where one of the brothers is kicking the other guy's hands off? Yes. What's going <laughs> that, on? That was there? a plan for a second. Yeah. I paused it and it's fucking incredible. So the point is he's trying to escape from the handcuffs. So the one who can get his foot free is going to break his hand off off Wolverine. Yeah. Enough so that he can slip it through the thing. But but his (laughs) hands, if you watch it scene, his Uh hands aren't like cuffed through the chair. He's just they're just behind him. Right. The solution is for him to stand up. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I want him to walk over to the other side of the room and like pick up a toilet and be like, all right, so what are we doing? (laughs) What's next? (laughs) This works real well. So they have this incredibly unlikely escape. But then fucking Willem Dafoe shows up with Bugs Bunny tactics. You guys (laughs) liked this movie? Really? This part's amazing. In it? Willem Dafoe is a beautiful man. And now he's dressed up uh, like a girl bunny bugs bunny trick. And he's beautiful like this, too. It's fantastic. We had me and Heath had an amazing moment. So we were like, "Okay, we're going to do the Boondock Saints. Have a good vacation, blah, blah, blah. And as we were about to hang up, I was like, hey, does the scene where Willem Dafoe dresses like a lady hold up? Yeah. And we both sort of paused and remembered that scene existed. And I was like. I gotta go. I just got a car trip in the morning. I'll let you know. I'll go see the movie. I gotta go watch Bill Burr's set on Netflix. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, yeah, well, okay. All right. So here's what happened then in this universe. Willem Dafoe realized there was going to be more bad guys than he thought, right, when when, uh, when he talked to the Mafia Don. So he went home, dressed up like a lady, and then went to the house. And pretended to be a prostitute so that he could get into a house that opened the door for him any fucking way. It's literally the old South Park joke where the police chief keeps dressing up like a female prostitute and having yes. sex with people to try. And get. It's that, but like dead serious. <laughs> yeah. With the Sherlock. It's like if Sherlock Holmes had been like, Watson, there's only one way to <laughs> get inside Moriarty's fortress. So. We fuck each other. 
What? Yeah. <laughs> Can you put right. your ankles behind your head, Watson? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but then, okay, so he's about to fuck one of the bad guys. I I feel like he's going to go the whole way with the guy, but his wig comes off, and like Clark Kent without any glasses, now the guy can tell he's very clearly not a lady at all. Wait a minute. You're Willem Dafoe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought you were really good in Antichrist, and I know it was a dark film, <laughs> so not a lot of people saw it, but I thought you did a really great job. Do you think I pulled me. off okay. the lady outfit? Because you oh, didn't absolutely. notice until this now. Absolutely. Green right? Goblin, Antichrist, this movie. You crushed I mean, it. <laughs> I got, I, you know what? I think I kind of look like Jane Fonda, right? Like a Jane, like a Grace and Frankie, right? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pulling that off, you would say? <laughs> I would like you to just say what I said so I can hear it. <laughs> I have a gun. I just, yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out, though, that like, had he gone dressed the way he was dressed when he learned all of this shit, Rocco would still be alive, right? Rocco died for this disguise. <laughs> But I'm happy that Rocco's dead. Yeah, well, so I don't no, know like that. everyone in this movie, you kill every goddamn one of them. I wanted this to continue like Billy Connolly shows up and he's dressed as a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you boys would be needing a hand. <laughs> With the beard still and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh. so <laughs> one other moment in this scene. Can we talk about the lip fluttery gunshot? When he does the, when, he, when he shoots this guy right after he's found out to be not in fact a lady prostitute, I do not remember this. Please take me. Are there. you serious? I you have no idea what it. you're talking about. So he yeah. he sees that it's a wig and he gets mad and he's like, "You're Willem Dafoe, the actor. What's going on?" And that's when Willem Dafoe grabs into his purse that he has where he's got his gun, and he's like on the floor at this point, and he sits up and shoots the guy in the face. But right as he does that, it's in slow mo, and we watch, we watch Willem Dafoe make the like, uh, like the motorboaty like brrr, lip flappy thing in slow mo. Really? While he shoots him, that's that's not the like the most memorable visual of the whole thing to you guys. It is not, but it does bring up a staggering reality, which means that Willem Dafoe, the I think Oscar winning actor, no. sat up and was like. Bakoo, 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 and it was caught on camera. <laughs> yep, yep. No, you are correct. Except that Willem Dafoe has never won an Oscar. God damn it. Um, I I would stake my life on robbed. It. I probably shouldn't stake my life. I will stake like my left uh, pinky finger on it. He's never won an Oscar. I don't. Let's think... stake Heath's life on. He was in. It. All right, we'll stake. He was Heath's in Platoon. Life. I don't know if he won one, but the some. some I, I'm stuff. sure he's been nominated. I don't. Yeah. I do not think he's won. All right. Anyways, now, now well, I should not say I should never say shit well, like this. On you never the fucking know. Boondock Saints three is coming out <laughs> in yeah. production. He's gonna get that nod. <laughs> All right. So now we we cut to three months later because I I guess that wasn't the finale. What the fuck ever. I'm objectively right. This is a fucking terrible movie. I'm so the glad the endings guys... <laughs> plurium of this movie are the final <laughs> awfulness on top of the awful cake. <laughs> oh, fuck, it's so bad. It's okay, so Papa John is, is going to trial, right? All the other bad guys got killed, but Papa John got away at the end. And now, we okay, so we've got all the reporters sitting around at his trial going, like, talking about, like, oh, well, you know, he's very clearly guilty, but, um, you know, he, he won't get convicted, I'm sure. And it's, like, so, so unrealistic, the idea that the press would just sit around during a trial that, where somebody was clearly guilty and talk about how he was going to get off. But there is certainly no moral dilemma if somebody were to mo make a movie of this and be the vigilantes, they are ethically correct. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Is the conversation that was happening when suddenly the main characters now with Billy Connolly, who, by the way, is is their, their dad? Yeah. Or, he's yeah. their dad because he knew their like weird Irish killing prayer thing. And I know that this is the movie's way. <laughs> this was the movie's way of telling us that they, they're dead, but I wanted him so badly to know it because all Irish people only have two customs and they don't know it until you point it out to them. It's just that stupid ring from Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you made the road <laughs> rise up to meet you. He's just like, yeah, we got like three things. <laughs> <laughs> there is a killing prayer. That's real. That's true. It's a fun poem. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. How often have you used it? <laughs> I. It's not important. Well, he doesn't play uh, Call of Duty, but if he did. Choose not to incriminate myself. 
So yeah, Great. so they take over the courtroom, the the McManus brothers and the McManus dad, I guess now at this point. And he has the whole, you know, there will be sequels speech. This is totally justified. Uh, sure wish people in real life would follow the example of this movie and go out ki- and kill people that they think are criminals. Yeah. He goes through a weird side tangent where he's like, and just to be clear, we are not going to kill litterers no. or like tax frauds. <laughs> cool. What, who else will you not be killing? And literally one of the lines, it's from the like the Statue of Liberty line. He's like, we don't yeah. want your poor, your wretched. We won't kill immigrants. Just to be clear. Uh, okay, that was a weird announcement. We're killing bad guys only. We're never doing bad guys. Now that I say we yeah. won't kill immigrants, I feel like you guys are going to think we are killing immigrants. Technically, we've killed Italian and Russian immigrants forced into crime syndication by race. So you know what? This has all gone way off track. <laughs> the point is, though, is that we're going to kill this mafia guy. Ewan McGregor's an asshole, also. <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you saw... And then he ends it. He ends it by going, "If you saw evil, you will rape it." And everyone um, in the courtroom's like, "I'm sorry, what?" He's supposed to be saying like, "Reap the consequences. You'll reap it if you cross this line. <laughs> yes. We'll kill you, and you'll reap the consequences." And he's like, "And on that day, you will rape it." <laughs> yes. Everybody is like, "Sorry." Rape it? <laughs> no, no, not rape it. Rape no, it. you're you're you, rape it. You're here. You're saying say the two words. <laughs> say the two words next to each other. No, no wh- that you think are the two different words that are happening right what now. What I'm saying is, if you do bad things, uh-huh. we are going to rape. No, <laughs> rape, rape everyone what? who rapes so? the bad. Uh, <laughs> you guys talk weird. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now. The news lady from Channel 22 wraps things up. I typed that so hopefully. I typed wrap <laughs> things up so hopefully. At the beginning of so many scenes in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. But so now we're going to end with a, a goddamn series of man on the street arguments about whether this movie has any good guys in it. Right. And it does. It's concluded <laughs> by the city of Boston. It's just oh. like a couple people who are like, I don't know, because, you know, murdering, it, that's also murdering if you murder, right? Right. But everybody yeah. else is like, fuck you. Every city, every kill them all. Yeah. Exact quote. No, look, this. in case you didn't catch the moral of the goddamn story, the movie itself stops, looks us directly in the eye and says, you should kill gang members and drug dealers with a gun. And then it ends. You and McGregor is wrong. We should murder people. Done. <laughs> the end. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of Boondock Saints. I will never have to watch that again. And that's a real relief. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet, though, because we still need to do a religious movie. Legit. Eli, tell us what's on deck. The Boondock well, Saints 2. Two. No, no, yes. no, 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 <laughs> no, no, I, no. You know, we all needed something beautiful, something we can all get behind. And so next week we will be reviewing... Gwyneth Paltrow's new oh. show on Netflix. The oh. Goop Lab. The oh, Goop Lab. Because look, because like, listen, statistically speaking, there are a lot of listeners to this show. They're like, I fucking liked Boondock Saints. Why are they? They spent this whole episode calling me a racist and a homophobe. Fuck them. So it's good to know that we've got that for them next we'll week. We'll bring you back next week for the Goop Lab. <laughs> but seriously, you don't like this movie. You should no, rewatch it. No, it really is. It's incredibly like. terrible. Trust me. Even you. <laughs> <laughs> don't like this movie so with that to look forward to we're going to bring episode 232 to a merciful close once again a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go if you'd like to count yourself among the ranks you can make a per episode donation to patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad free version of every episode you can also help a ton by leaving us a five star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms and if you enjoy this show be sure to check out our sibling shows the scaling of the citation needed and the skeptic card available wherever podcasts live if you have questions comments or cinematic suggestions you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres Tim Robinson takes care of our social media our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars all of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work harder on another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Troy Duffy went on to make the Boondock Saints 2 All Saints Day. It is even better. It's like, it's like two hours and 20 minutes long and it made 
like $11 million at the box office. It's Lemon on the docket. juice in your penis is better. Um, Troy Duffy then went on to... Nope, nope, sorry. That's literally... That's it. <laughs> he made a short about Knight Rider. <laughs> Willem Dafoe made penance for this movie by getting his penis squished in the movie Antichrist. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. We went on to review the Boondock Saints 3, whatever it's called, and it will be amazing. I cannot wait. My Breakfast Club clothes built off of Heath's last joke. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, no, I'll do the same. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.